Good morning, good day, wherever you are. We hope you're having a great one. I'm Rick Zanotti, and you're watching eLearn Chat. Um, and joining me right next to me is Don Mahoney. Hey, Don, how are you again? Good morning again. Glad everybody's here. We have a full chat room today. We do. And for all of those who are watching live or who are watching the recording later on, uh, we've had some issues with Skype. So this is, I think, the fourth time we've started the show, and this time should be the charm. I think we're, we're doing well right now. We've got a great guest today, somebody that a lot of you know from just going back a long ways to your authorware days, if you've done authorware or if you've been involved in any kind of e-learning. Um, our guest name has popped up many times. And joining us today is Dr. Michael Allen. Michael, how are you today? I'm well, thank you. Good morning. Well, Michael, sorry we've had the, uh, the Skype issues today, but it sounds like we've got it resolved right now, and, and you look great on camera. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Somebody so. just typed in they miss author wear. Oh, don't don't we all? <laughs> author wear, yes. That was a labor of love, I have to say, and I, I miss it, I'm sure, as much as anyone else. You know, it's funny. We all we all a lot of us used it. We we used author wear heavily back in those days and to this day, even though there's a lot of good authoring tools out there, no one no one really has the power that Authorware did back then. Uh, in terms of the way you could build your app. You could build authorware code that built authorware programs, which was great. It, it, it just, uh, just can't really do that right now. And so, yes, we all miss that in, in a lot of different ways. Now, you folks at Allen Attractions have come up with a new product that is, is gaining a lot in popularity, and it's very powerful, and that's Zebra's apps. We had, um, we had your son, Christopher Allen, on last week. In fact, this is a, this is a first two for eLearn Chat. We've got... We're becoming a family show. We've got we had Christopher <laughs> on last week, and today we've got Fathered Michael. So this is great. Um, but no, Zebra Zaps is a great product, and I'm looking forward. In fact, right after this, we're going to a webinar. I think at 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock your time um, on Zebra Zaps. So we're looking forward to the new pro features and and what's coming out in that. But you guys did a great job on that one. Well, thank you. I it. Uh We've, we've struggled along ourselves with all the custom e-learning development that uh, our studios do, uh, trying to find a tool that, that allows us to build the learning experiences that we think are really best. You know, the, the technology should not be telling us what to do. It ought to be allowing us to do the things that, that we know help people uh, develop skills and, and more of their abilities. And uh, I just felt there, there were not tools out there other than uh, working at a pro in a programming language uh, that allowed us to implement the, the experiences that are really worth the learner's time. And that's really, I always think, that's what we have to keep in mind. It's not about our development time so much as uh, is this experience going to be beneficial to the end learner. And, and if if it isn't, uh, then we're all wasting our time. And uh, I think I think the tools have put a real damper on the quality of learning experiences that uh, we're all putting out. So uh, Zebra is uh, uh, every but every bit as much a labor of love as Authorware was. And uh, if we had had the capabilities in the Authorware that we have in Zebra, it's hard to imagine what level of learning experiences we'd be putting out today. That's true, because that was quite a few years ago. And, and yet even for its day, Authorware is still pretty advanced. Um, and, and the metaphor worked really well. Now, it, it did, didn't it? Yeah, I, I, I always tell people that um, I, I wish I could claim more, more credit for seeing into the future, but in truth, all I was doing was trying to develop the tool that I wanted. Uh, it just turned out that a lot of other people wanted the same thing, <laughs> <laughs> thankfully. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, now, recently you just put out a brand new book, um, Leaving Addy for Sam, and that's probably getting a little bit of, of eh, probably I wouldn't say controversy, but people, every time you touch the word Addy, people go kind of crazy out there. Um, but it, it's actually a, a very good book. It's, a, it's an easy read, very interesting. And, and what, I, what I enjoyed about it, aside from the, if you want to call it the technical side of, of, of what you're talking about, is it's a very accessible book and just kind of brings it down to uh, – common sense. It's a, it's a lot of common sense. For those who haven't read the book yet or aren't familiar with Sam, can you can you describe a little bit what Sam is and and why we've left Daddy for it? 
I'd, I'd, be, I'd be happy to. Uh, yes, it, it was a book that was actually commissioned by ASTD. Um, I had made a few comments in presentations I'd made at conferences that we no longer f found Addy to be a, a, a very viable process for getting the products out that we wanted. And I, I uh, used to teach Addy and, and believe pretty, pretty strongly in it, and yet um, I've watched a lot of organizations, in, including my studios, uh, working with the process and not feeling like we were getting the bang for our buck that, uh, that we, we wanted. But um, I hasten to say right away, if you've got a process that works for you, Addy or otherwise, uh, and you really like the products you're getting and you feel like it's very efficient with your, your time and resources, then, then that's the process for you and, and you should use it. But having made some comments that Addy wasn't quite what we needed, why ASTD invited me first to speak on this topic and I, I wanted to make sure there was an exit door close to the podium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of buzz I mean, in the halls about it at ICE in May. <laughs> yes. Standing room I, only in your room too, as I understand it. Well, we uh, it, it's amazing. I first of all, I didn't know if people would show up at all, but uh, I thought. Um, you know, if I could share something that works for us and it helps people, then then I ought to do it. But I also knew that there were going to be people in the room who were Addy advocates and were not going to be comfortable with some of the things I was saying. So it, <laughs> I wanted to be sure I had an escape route uh, and maybe an umbrella <laughs> handy to deflect tomatoes. Uh, but um, uh, we did attract huge audiences uh, and uh, I, yeah, we've had fire marshal actually have to turn people away from rooms where hmm. I've been talking about uh, Sam because uh, the, the attractiveness has uh, really pulled in audiences so I'm, I'm really happy about that. I, I do know that there are, there are uh, conversations going on uh, from what I call Addy Advocates which I, again, if it's really working for you and you're happy with it, why wouldn't you advocate it? And, and so I, I understand that. But um, I, I do think that there is a better process. Uh, and uh, we've been, I've really been working on trying to refine that process uh, for decades uh, now, to, to tell the truth. This is, I started working on this in the, in the 70s, actually, trying to figure out a better process than, than Addy. So um, I do have a, a, a few slides if we can do some screen sharing. That sounds great. All right. All right. Let's see if if we can uh, wield the technology here. And, 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 the, and there's no truth to the rumor that you've got a security detail attached to you at all times right now, right? <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> they, they follow me Those, everywhere I go. Hey, STD ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I sometimes feel like I'm this evil person, you know, out there uh, somehow, um, uh, uh, somehow... <laughs> Uh, trying to disrupt the the lives of people, and I tell you, a little bit of disruption is a good thing because we all get complacent, I think, and uh, and aren't uh, aren't aren't doing the best we can because we're we're comfortable where we are. Uh, but uh, it, in in truth, I think uh, we should all be looking at continuous change and continuous improvement. Uh, so, and there we go. So now I'm seeing your screen. You see the screen, okay. Yep. First, we all are seeing your screen right now, with where it says Sam, and we can see the cover. Excellent, excellent. Before uh, that, I wrote picture of Chris. <laughs> right on. It was a picture of Chris. Uh, <laughs> he's helping out. Yes. <laughs> uh, I wrote this book with Richard Seitz, and uh, I thought that was important because uh, Richard heads our operations in Florida, and is building uh, many, many uh, learning programs, both instructor-led and e-learning, um, all the time, you know, working with teams that are doing this. And he uses the SAM process, which is short for a successive approximation model, which I'll describe in some detail here in, in a bit. Uh, and uh, 
and he can verify that this isn't just theory, but the, that the things that we're sharing really work for him and work for his people and work for, for our clients. So it's, it's not just a, this might be a good idea, but it's, it's something that works in the field. And I was uh, really feeling privileged to have his experience behind the book and it allowed us to put uh, anecdotes in there that I hope people will find useful, uh, if not just amusing. <laughs> Um, so, I, in, picking a, in picking a process, it, it seems to me that uh, it's, it, the process you want is the one that produces the product that you want. Uh, they, need to be, they need to go hand in hand. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it seems like you first should be describing what product you really want and then select what you think is going to be the most effective uh, and efficient process for it. Um, so we're, we try to keep our eye on success, you know, and uh, the success of our learners, the people whose performance we're trying to help improve. And um, I, I always define success in the simple way. Uh, success comes from doing the right thing at the right time. Um, you know, if you're on a diet, you know, your success comes from eating the right things at the right time, not eating the wrong things at the... Uh, at other times and so on. Uh, and, and it's true no matter what, if it's managing an organization, launching a product, giving customer service, uh, no matter what, I think all successes come from doing the right thing at the right time. Um, and I, I want to point out that it, it, we're not saying knowing what you ought to do. That's not success. It's actually doing the right thing at the right time. So knowing is not enough. It's, it's all about performance. And that's true in school, too. I don't see a difference in the academic uh, world uh, versus training. So um, there are various ways to go about trying to achieve success. Uh, one of them is what I call just tell and test, which is the, perhaps the oldest uh, instructional model uh, around. And it, it, it tell and test, you, <laughs> you, you basically deliver information, whether it's through lectures, presentations, uh, textbooks, combination of videos or whatever it might be. Uh, and then people know that, well, you're going to be tested at the, at the end. Uh, this is done over and over again. It's done in our schools everywhere. I was taught that way. I'm sure you guys were too. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and many of our kids are still today. Uh, but in my view, it's, it's, it's kind of one of the worst uh, uh, paradigms you could choose. Uh, it, it has a slow ramp up at the, at the beginning here because you tell and test, you're telling everybody the same thing. Well, not everybody is, is going to respond well to that. Some are going to be bored because they already knew this. Others are not going to understand it because it's too deep, it's going too fast, and so forth. So it's not individualized. Um, but, you know, eventually you, you hope to break through to at least most people. And, and then we experience this uh, uh, post-test extinction. That is, how many of us would want to take a test we just took uh, a week later or, or even two days later? <laughs> Because we forget, right? You know, and we learn how to use our minds efficiently, so we learn how to prepare ourselves for a test. If that's the objective, uh, you, 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 you do this efficiently, and it's also efficient to forget it the, the next day. <laughs> so we do. Right. And this is, this is not success. You know, it's, it's far from it. No, and I read somewhere years ago that people forget about 80% of what they learn in school, if not even a little bit more. That's right. That's why the success of the TV show, you know, so uh, are you smarter than a fifth grader, you know, <laughs> all that stuff. Um, and, and, and we know that you're going to forget that stuff. So yeah, from my point of view, that's not the product I'm going after. So I don't want a process that's geared to doing that. Um, and to tell you the truth, there are, there are a lot of attributes of Addy that I think are geared toward doing that. But then people will immediately say, my opposing advocates will immediately say, well, no, 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 you could build any kind of instructional product using the Addy process. And I say, yes, it's true. Uh, but if you look at the products that most people produce from Addy, it fits, it fits too uncomfortably close to this, to this model. So if not that, I guess, then what, right? Um, 
if if we build things that are really interactive, and I mean interactive by being sensitive to you as a learner, so that uh, if you if if you cannot rise to a challenge that's put in front of you early on, and I'm one of those people that says on the first screen, on the first page is your first challenge, you know, see if you can do this. Uh, if you can, that's great. We pat you on the back. We, we bow to your, your greatness, and we move you on to something more advanced. And, and if you can't, we say, ah, dear learner, this is something that you are very quickly going to be able to do successfully with our help. Let us help you, uh, let, let's help you perform this, this task. And, and so almost immediately we start, uh, we start building not only knowledge, but abilities or skills, which is really what we're interested in, not just being able to answer questions about something like, uh, I, I know how... Uh, from reading in a book, you're supposed to hold the bow for a violin, <clears throat> but you never picked one up. You know? <laughs> so. Now, you know, that's a, that's a great point. One, one thing I've noticed, and we've been trying to do this for, I don't know, 17, 20 years, and that's to exactly do what you said, which is throw out a question they may not know, but to see what they know. And yeah. we get so much pushback from, from the customers saying, no, 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 they don't know that, you got to go back. No, no, the whole idea is to try to test them a little bit. See, get them motivated, get them, put it in context that, hey, you need to know this. And unfortunately, it's like hitting, uh, I don't know, it's like, it's like trying to catch a chimp who's running around doing something and they're too busy, they're too distracted. And they go, no, no, we don't want that. You have to do it this way. And as a result, the learning is so boring. Okay. And that, I think we all struggle with that. We we do, and uh, you know, people have very strong opinions about these things. It's 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 sort of as if uh, uh, you know, going to the dentist for years now qualifies you as a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm picturing that, or a masochist. I'm not sure which, but <laughs> right. right. You know, we've all been learners, and, and many of us have been subjected to a tell and test sort of uh, approach, and so we begin to believe that that's what we want and that's what should be done. And, and, and in fact, you know, if, if you talk to almost any expert in, in learning or instruction, uh, they will immediately say, as we're discussing here, you, you need to show out, throw out the question or the, or the challenge right up front to find out, do you have, kind of to test the waters, to find out what the individual learner really needs, can do and can't do, so you can adjust what's going to happen next. And with technology, of course, we're, we're really able to do that adjustment uh, to extremes and, and make good use of time. Uh, those same people, though, that will tell you they don't want you to, to put that challenge right up front will perhaps also say, uh, but, you know, I would like this to have the excitement and the energy of a game. Right, right. Well, right. especially for the learners that are coming up, we have to be agile that way, right? Games are what they're used to um, and learn from and, and, and are going to be attracted to. So uh, whether it's Madden football or World of Warcraft or all the other ones in between, we need to be ready to develop that way. And my favorite is, you know, we want a game, but we only want it to cost $5,000. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> here's, here's a link to Second Life. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so all, all of those games put out a challenge right away. You know, I mean, that's what you expect. You don't want a game that that requires you to to read for two hours before you can do anything. Nobody go that far. They'll sh shut it off far below before that. Um, so, in fact, our learners shut us off too when we when we do that same sort of thing, and we have to try to recover and. We try to force them by saying, well, there's a test and, and, and you're going to be penalized if you're not getting this. And so right. people force themselves through and struggle, but that's just misguided terribly, I think. Um, so um, there, there are other things that uh, we can do be, be, besides making things uh, interactive and uh, uh, in individualized. We can add distributed practice. I mean, we've known since... Skinner's pigeons and mice and studies over a long period of time that distributed practice is really powerful. 
Uh, you don't want to mass all your practice all together, but you want it you want it distributed over time, and there are various uh, schedules that we know work better. Uh, so, what 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 do we do? Most of our training programs have a, a fixed amount of time, and then they stop. Mm -hmm. but just like the worst thing you could possibly do, you know, you should do a small part of it, get people practicing, uh, working on the job, and then incrementally give them more practice and, and more skills and put it out over time. And the payback is many, many times uh, what you'd get otherwise. So uh, you're building um, a series of repetitions in throughout any module? Uh, Yes, even even within a, in, in an instructional program, uh, you, you should have distributed practice. I mean, one of my favorite things that uh, uh, that uh, we did actually with our kids uh, sometimes when uh, they were in uh, grade school and have have used with many of our corporate clients as well is is. Uh, in a drill, we ask a question, and if you if you uh, get it right, we put it back in the stack, and we're going to ask you again, even though you got it right. But we maybe <laughs> ten questions later. Uh, if you get it wrong, we're going to ask you another question, and then come right back to that one again. Okay, so that they're using that the front of their brain right away. Yeah, if yeah. you know you're going to be asked this question again in you know in five minutes, you rehearse in your head. Right. <laughs> you know, so you're ready for it because you don't want to look like an idiot. Like I just, <laughs> just gave me the answer to that question. How can I not know it now? Uh, and so, once you catch on to this idea that over time I'm going to need to perform again, you, it, you prepare yourself for it. It's just like you prepare yourself for a post test in that talent yeah. test. You optimize your ability for what you are expecting to be exposed to. And uh, if it's just a post test, then you prepare yourself in a way that is going to re allow you to forget all that you knew very, in a very short amount of time. If you know that you're going to be tested in a way, using test kind of in a generic way, being challenged again, uh, over a period of time, then you prepare yourself to remember. Uh, and to keep that. And, you know, we just know these fundamental things. They're not, I think, in any way controversial. <laughs> uh, so, so if this is where we want to go, I think this, this really helps, uh, helps us think about what kind of process we want. Um, we, we, tend to, uh, we tend to talk in terms of, of uh, CCAF uh, around here, which is uh, the way to build really effective learning experiences is to is to have a meaningful context that uh, that gives you the the power of a person saying I can imagine myself being in this situation, uh, and then we put a challenge into it where you have to respond, and then you're active, which we think is really important for for learning, uh, and then show you the consequences of your action in in feedback. You know, you know, it's interesting, Michael, because I think your first C, context, is probably what's left out of so much training and e-learning. And people don't even know why they're taking certain things. Um, it's, it's just something endemic to the field right now. Without context, it has no relevance to people. Right. I right. love that. Could you say it like 10 more times? Oh, I, I could. I, I'm, I'm always arguing that point. And it just, <laughs> it's just amazing how much training gets put out there just to say, okay, we've trained you. Well, no, you Check haven't trained out. anybody. You've just talked to them. You haven't told them why they're learning this or what the importance is. And as a result, they're not getting much out of it, which is you know, sort of sort of interesting. Um, and I, I, I'd venture to say that probably 75%, if not more, of corporate learning goes, is just wasted because the, the people never really get it. They, they get the fear factor of, oh, I've got to take a test or, or I may not get a promotion or I may not, I may not have a job. But they don't understand why half of what they're doing is what they're doing. That's right. Uh, so. It is by far the most important of the four elements, as far as I'm concerned. It's that context. It answers the question, why should I be interested in this in the first place? What am I going to get out of this? Where am I going with it? You know? And if you can't, if you can't connect with your learners uh, uh, at the outset, then you've, you've lost. You might as well. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> So, uh, 
uh, in um, uh, in a couple of uh, my other books, and then in a in a fairly recent one, which is on um, uh, learner interface design, um, I've added to the CCAF notion that in order to make it all work, you need to connect to the learner, and we're talking about that through context is is probably the best way to do that. Then you need to empower them to try things, you know, to to experiment. Uh, what we watch in, in, in learners who are particularly good at self-guiding themselves, they like to make mistakes to see what happens when you make a mistake because they learn from that. Uh, people who are not particularly skilled learners and need more guidance try to avoid making mistakes uh, and they deprive themselves of the feedback that you get uh, and sometimes the very vivid imagery and mental models that you get from making a mistake. So we like to empower people to actually try things in different ways to see what really works, what doesn't really work, and maybe the things in between to get a, get a fuller understanding. And so that's empowerment. But to make all of that happen then is uh, you need some technology or you need various uh, role-playing uh, setups or materials and that's what we call orchestrate. You then now need to take this and make a learning experience out of it. Um, so if that's where we're trying to go, at least I, I only share this because that's where we're trying to go and we advocate that. I hope that's where others are trying to go too. Uh, if you look back at Addy, <coughs> This is perhaps the, the classical model of Addy, uh, and you see along the top the analysis, development, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, design, development, implementation, and evaluation, ADE. Um, there isn't anything here that is not a good idea uh, in terms of something to do. I think all of these things are important. It's just hard to see what we were just talking about in it. You know, the, 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 the context and the challenge and the activity stuff. You can get so uh, uh, tangled up in doing each one of these tasks that you, you miss the, the big goal, the big picture of where you're trying to go uh, and what you're trying to do. This, I think, is very much a process more focused on the content than it's focused on the learner and the learner's experience. Um, and so it's, it's hard for me to imagine uh, a movie maker or a novelist or any other creative media uh, enterprise looking at something like this and saying, well, this is how we're going to attract audiences. You know, I, just, I don't think it works that way. You start with a kernel of an inspiring idea and flesh it out into, into something that makes a meaningful and memorable experience. So, uh, unfortunately, when I talk about Sam, uh, if I open myself to questions from audiences, I get mired down in conversations about Addy. Uh, so, I just want to mention that uh, the, the reason the book is uh, titled somewhat controversially is because we are trying to be a bit disruptive and say maybe the process that a lot of people have sort of crowned as the standard process uh, is, isn't something that should be accepted without uh, consideration. And, and Michael, I think you make a really good point that, in essence, it's a process. It's right. one of many. It is, and the process gives you at least a foundation, but beyond that, you have to adapt any process to your situation. And, and that's where I think your book makes a good point, that process is one thing, but the process has to make sense and it has to evolve and, yeah. and be flexible has to be flexible and overall it just has to produce the right product you know the one that you really really want it, it isn't a matter of checking off <clears throat> excuse me all of the all of the steps and requirements in a process and say I've done a good job because of that uh, when in fact the product that you put out is not producing improved performance learners are bored you know whatever the failings might be you can't maintain that it was a great product uh, just because you followed a process. It goes the other way around. Can the process be considered a good one? Uh, uh, and the answer is, well, let's look at the product first. Was that good? And if, uh, if it were, then the question is, were you efficient with your resources? So Sam uh, 
uh, is, is at heart a really simple idea by comparison, a really simple idea. Uh, and, and that's uh, you are going to iterate evaluation, design, and development. Uh, and you do that until you get, either you run out of time, which is a very real consideration, but it's okay, I'll come back to that, and or you get the product that you want. Um, so uh, in evaluation, with, you would start at the very beginning by saying, who needs to perform what? You know, that's a very simple analysis kind of a question, uh, but any, any team or organization that's beginning a project has some notions about who needs to do better. Now, often the immediate connection is made that those people who need to do better are the ones to be trained, because it just makes sense. But in lots of cases, they're either not the only ones that need to be trained, or in fact, the focus in the wrong, is in the wrong place. Lots of times, it's the supervisors of people who need to be retrained. That was um, one of the questions that came in, is how to uh, talk about this and introduce the idea at work. So to migrate from Addy to a more specific process like SAM. So if you have talking points, they're asking for them. That's good. Uh, the, the first thing that we do is to try to find out, are we all in agreement of what the goals are and, and, and what we're actually going to uh, uh, do as an attempted solution? Uh, and it's not good to go off into a, a, a quiet room and come up with the answer and then show it to everybody. Because lots of times people will, uh, will uh, uh, agree with something just because a lot of work went into it. Um, and uh, I really like uh, uh, Alison Rossett's book uh, that she wrote some, some years ago, which is First Things Fast, uh, in which she picks up just this whole notion of, of analysis and getting started, saying that it's so easy to get into analysis paralysis mm -hmm. that come up with the wrong answer. Uh, so we've we've taken her lessons and said let's get the stakeholders together in a room and let's find out what they think as a group needs to be done and they could be entirely wrong but at least we've got the attention and involvement of key people and that's really important um, in fact if, if if you look at the uh... i'm gonna back up a minute if you look at addy you don't see anything in here about finding out who are the key stakeholders? Uh, who might veto something halfway through because it isn't what they expected? <laughs> uh, we, we run into those very real things all the time. Uh, like uh, someone will fund a project and then delegate getting it done uh, to someone else and they'll be working through it and e even sometimes as close as almost ready to deliver the, the person in real authority and control will then say, y you know, that thing is all video, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think we call those our nightmare customers. <laughs> <laughs> and there are what lots. And there's lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they're internal customers as well. That's Sometimes true. That's more difficult. Absolutely they are. Um, you know, in fact, I find myself uh, as a customer doing a lot of the things that I hate that our real customers do. When we do <laughs> internal projects, you know, we'll get something started. And I, I have in my mind what I think that the team is going to do. And I have really good people, so I think, you know, well, they, they will think about this the same way that I do. And they'll, they'll start out doing something and they'll take a look at it and they'll say, oh, no, 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 that's <laughs> That's not what I want. Uh, very often, um, it is what I want, and, and I, I just need to spend more time uh, taking a look at it. But this is a problem when you, you have a, a lack of unity uh, that's undiagnosed. Uh, you know, the longer it goes on, the bigger the problem is. I, I don't find in, in, the, in Addy, as you look at, you know, this leads to this, leads to this, you go down each column and then you go down to the next phase, even if you jumble it up, which a lot of the advocates say, well, we just don't do it in this order, so, you know, fine, uh, but where is it that you, you focus on 
uh, the key stakeholder, for example, and, and make sure that, that they're, uh, they're in concert with what's going on. And many, many other questions of real life process that you can ask of Addy, and it's just not, it's not called out. Well, you know, it's real interesting because what, what we've seen a lot with, with customers and just people we've talked to throughout the years is they're very stuck on the process, whether it's Addy or something else. Usually it's an Addy kind of process or, or some variant of it. And they spend more time working on the project management and the process than they actually do developing the piece. Yes. <laughs> and, and it's really mind-boggling. You say, okay, you just spent $5,000 on this and twenty. Oh, let's say $20,000 on your project management and, and 15000 on developing it. Something's wrong there, um, and it, 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 we see it all the time. It just—it's uh, an interesting thing. I guess that justifies the project management title for a lot of people, but they do get stuck in the minutia. And, and the Addy process, if you follow it to a T, will stick you in that minutia. It will. It will. Especially if you use Microsoft Project. Oh, I hate Project. Yeah, <laughs> I know a lot of people love it. It's—it's it's, uh, you know. We've been in business for, I don't know, since 1984, so you know, 28 years. I can count on one hand the times I've actually used a project management tool to manage a project. Very few. Right. Very few. Uh, only really big ones, and even then. Yep. Uh, it, it just somehow gets in the way mm -hmm. rather than helping you, and, and it eats up your time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, the, so the SAM approach actually makes a lot of sense, and it's extremely agile. Yes, it is, and this is it's a, a, a good choice of words because uh, when we started working on on designing this process, the, you know, the word agile and and the modern day implications of that as a process uh, had yet to be discovered, mm -hmm. and we were just dealing with these very real world issues that we've been discussing here, trying to figure out how can we get a better product in less time with less effort, with less <laughs> internal friction. Uh, you know, and everybody having a better time rather than saying, "Well, you're you're you missed objectives here. There should have been you you missed three vital objectives, and we now know that uh, at the end of the process." Right. Whose fault is that? It, I really find Addy execution uh, very much uh, producing uh, fault finding expeditions, uh, and who you know that's not. <laughs> <laughs> how you want to spend your time and energy. You want to, you want to uh, use it really having fun and develop learning experiences that everybody benefits from. So, so the, again, the very, very core of this idea is that it's going to be iterative. You're not going to do all of your analysis, all your design, all your development, and hope that you didn't make any mistakes along the way. Um, but you're, you're going to expect to make mistakes from the very beginning and make course corrections frequently uh, as you're testing it out as, as everybody, including uh, representative learners, are taking a look at what you're doing and finding out if it works. So in a very small project, which we, we call uh, SAM-1, a, a, a version of uh, successive approximation that works well for, for relatively small projects. You know, maybe you're just doing uh, a one module at a time, an hour of instruction or, or uh, something of that sort. Then what we really advocate is interleaving development of the product with design and evaluation. Uh, so that instead of writing a specification document, say, you know, the, the, uh, the, the final product shall have these qualities and shall cover this content and shall do this, or uh, even storyboards, you know, that draw pictures, we, we develop something that people can try out. That, that, that stakeholder that was going to keep quiet is now seeing something very early on. And if they, if they wanted it more game-like, less game-like, more presentation, more video, more text, more role-playing, whatever it is, they'll start to see the, the first ideas early enough that they can make those comments and we can either convince that person that that's kind of the wrong direction or we can take that to heart and uh, and let it bias us and and do a redes redesign and a redevelopment of it um, and get it right. I like that um, the stakeholders are more that evaluation is built in from the beginning it's more visible this way and the stakeholders own a piece of the evaluation and reevaluation, where often that gets left to either not happen at all or that happens somewhere else. So I like that it's center. 
That's is, exactly. They're paying for it, right? Whether and you know they actually feel like more progress is being made because they see a product in development early on. Um, and it takes a lot of the anxiety out because if you leave all the development until later in the process, everybody starts to worry about can that actually be developed on time? Have we have we reached too far? It's, it's, we're asking for something far too elegant for our time and our abilities. Uh, or or should we be doing more? Well, we don't know when you do a linear thing, but when when you work it uh, when you work it through this iterative process, uh, you really see it developing and becomes tangible early on. Just one more picture for you: um, the the SAM two process uh, is is for larger, more formalized kinds of situations. Uh, it, it could be that you're going to outsource development uh, or you have uh, some specialized teams that are, are going to do the, the media work and uh, the programming and so forth. I tend to, I tend to think of this by the way, in terms of e-learning. Uh, but uh, as I said at the beginning, we, we use this process for all modes of, of instructional delivery regardless. But if, if you need to break it up a bit, then we break it up into these three phases of, of uh, uh, preparation where you, you, you gather whatever information you can find that's relatively easy to find, and then you do what we call a savvy start, which is basically a SAM1. Uh, you, you, take a, you take a stab at it. You put it on the table say, what if we do this? You produce something of a prototype uh, or a piece of work that you intend to throw out, but <clears throat> it helps everybody get coordinated and, and on the on the same path. Uh, and and often you find out that this is the best analysis you possibly could have done uh, because hidden hidden uh, informa pieces of information just spill out when you do this and in. in uh, and and opinions and and so on that that could have been hidden until later in the game are flushed out right away. You know, Michael, that's that's a really good point. Uh, many times, what we've done is we'll throw out something that I know isn't what they want, and and our people are going, but that's not what they want. I go, no, throw it out anyway. Yeah. And then when they see it, you get all the comments. And now you know exactly what they want. It, it it just works really well. It does. It's simple. <laughs> it's simple. Simple's good. <laughs> Oh, that's what we've been doing wrong. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> we've been making it complex and complicated. <laughs> it's been a lively chat in the chat room. Lots of um, endorsement for Sam, um, trying to pigeonhole and, and work Sam in with our regular processes today. Um, I'm going to try to copy the chat and see if I can save it because it's been fun. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. I mean, what, one of the things that I would plead with people not to do is to say, um, we, we do what you're saying in Sam, and we call it Addie. <laughs> <laughs> because everybody knows her. It confuses us all. <laughs> I guess you could call it Saddy. <laughs> oh, don't go there. <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> Well, you know, as we go through the process, we're really just repeating Sam ones, basically. You know, after after we decide we're kind of on the right path uh, and we're ready to go, there's going to be more uh, objectives and content and work to be done than your high level stakeholders are going to have time for, and they're not going to want to be involved. And and indeed, it takes a lot of expertise and careful thought to de de define your your objectives and your goals and the uh, select the the right uh, instructional paradigm and so forth. So this is the dentist working. This is where the experts really need to work. You know, not just the people who have opinions, but people who really know what they're doing. But at least they know that they're on an acceptable, likely to be anyway, acceptable path. And we do do some project planning here uh, to lay this out to, to make sure that uh, we, we know what our resource availabilities are going to be. Um, you know, one of the biggest problems very often is availability of subject matter experts. Uh, you know, the, the, the more expert they are, the more in demand they, these people tend to be. And uh, so it, it, it can be difficult from a scheduling point of view, and we need to 
think about that and to make sure that we've made arrangements that are going to work. Uh, uh, and, and then the, the development phase. Now here's where Agile is becoming an industry standard, whether it's you know, developing uh, learning experiences or building a new uh, social network or accounting software or actually designing a, a new office building. Uh, the very concepts of, uh, of Agile apply here, which is you work in small steps, what we call sprints, most people do, uh, and you, you keep it short, you keep it simple, and you take a piece of work to completion so that people can evaluate it, take a, take a look at it and make sure that you're on the right path. You don't want a long span of implementation before people can evaluate it because then your risk just mounts on you about if you've made a mistake, if you're off, you know, even, you know, seven degrees, that could be costly. And so we want to do small pieces of work have people uh, take a look at it uh, and um, uh, and eventually roll out a product for uh, just the, as an overview. There's a lot more detail, of course. That's why Rich and I wrote a book. But <laughs> but that's that's really basically the whole concept. That's great. And and the book is really good reading. There's a lot of good stories in the book and and examples of real world development, which is I think where it really comes down to any process is meaningless unless you can actually apply it and do something good with it. And I think you show some really examples in the book of that. And uh, that, that alone makes the book well worthwhile. Oh, music to my ears. Yeah, and I'm not done reading the book. I'm about probably two thirds with it. Um, but I've, I've really enjoyed it. I ordered it. I haven't gotten it yet. So <laughs> I kindled it. <laughs> That's what I'll do. I, I, yeah, I ordered the paper, though. I want to get it signed. <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you in Dallas, if not before. Well, Michael, you're going to be at uh, DevLearn in a couple of weeks, correct? I am, indeed, yes. And, and standing near the door, but speaking on the... <laughs> <laughs> that should be fun. So anybody who's going to DevLearn, please drop by the Allen Interactions booth or go to some of the sessions that are being... Uh, given, I think you'll get some some good information out of it, and you'll you'll definitely have a good time. So a lot of exciting things happening there between Zebra Zaps and the new book and all that. That's some that's some good stuff. Well, thank you. Uh, you know they are they are interlinked uh, in that uh, uh, when I first started working on Authorware, a really smart friend of mine, his name was John Lovegood, and said before you start developing a tool you ought to know what process this tool is going to be used in, what's it going to support. And that's really the thing that kicked off my analysis of Addy, because uh, we were using it with, we had, uh, I was at Control Data working on the Plato project at the time, you know, and we were spending millions and millions of dollars in courseware development every year with, with, with hundreds of people working in it. And uh, I didn't feel like, you know, we were using our resources very well and uh, uh, we really had the experience where almost nobody really liked the end products that they produced. Almost everybody said, well, I didn't think that's what we were doing and my input really got distorted and we came out with something very surprising to me and I thought, this is not good, you know, and so I spent a fair amount of time talking with people who were working in the Addy process telling me how unhappy they were uh, and it was always somebody else's fault and I thought, well, that can't, that can't be. Well, that's built into Addy. It's built into Addy, right. Yeah. Accountability, so yeah process itself and so that's when we started trying to figure out how to do better and the idea of r rapid prototyping really came out quickly that people need to see what you're talking about not just hear your words read a specification document but they really need to see and feel as early as possible what somebody is proposing so they can make it that's true it's true you know my, my background came from the IT field I actually spent 25 years in IT from from programmer, program analyst, systems analyst, all the way to VP of IT in, in several companies. And I, Addy applies to IT as well as anything else. And I found it when I was managing projects, a complete waste of time to spend all that time managing the project. And rapid prototyping, I when 4GLs, what they call fourth generation languages came out back 
this is probably back in the 70s and 80s, I was one of the first on it. it it's all of a sudden you could prototype very quickly, rapid prototyping on everything you did. Applications could be built in a quarter of the time it took to do the whole process, and they were just as effective. And then the same thing holds true for e-learning right now. It's Again, if you can find tools that make that prototyping process easy, quick, it, all of a sudden your life's a lot easier, and the customers enjoy it more. True. I mean, yeah, it should be fun. If, if you're not enjoying the process, the, the, the pain and anguish you're going through is likely to uh, appear in the final product as well. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's probably going to be boring, and it's probably not going to be learner-centric and so on. Uh, so uh, that's why Zebra, again, uh, because we feel like we need a, a product that, that really uh, allows you to, to harness interactive media so quickly that you can put prototypes together even while people are discussing what they want to do. And yeah. then... Have, have enough power, like Authorware did, have enough strength and power in that tool that those prototypes can evolve into the end product. It's not like, okay, now we know what we want to do. Now let's start doing development for real. Uh, but uh, let's, let's keep embellishing, let's change, let's substitute, let's stretch, let's uh, add into it until we actually have the final product that we can roll out. Uh, and let's not require a lot of programming expertise, by the way. And uh, so that's that was the the charm and the dream of uh, of, of Zebra Zaps, and and man, it's uh, it's real. <laughs> yeah, it's and it's and it's really cool, especially coming from a programming background. I love the wiring. Uh, <laughs> I, I like the implementation. There used to be a tool I think called Softwire years ago that allowed you to wire Visual C plus plus and. Um, and uh, Visual Basic programs, and it was really cool. It, it works really well, because once you understand how one thing talks to another, all of a sudden now you're doing object-oriented programming without even knowing you're doing object-oriented programming. And that's that's the beauty of it. It makes it real easy. It is, it, 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 it becomes very natural. I, I, I know that uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, uh, programs that follow the interface of PowerPoint saying, well, this is really natural. We know all, we all know how to do that. Say, yeah, but that's not, you're not getting objects talking to each other and reacting and, and building consequences for uh, uh, decisions that, that learners make. So it, uh, while it may be familiar, it's, it's not getting you where you need to go, in, in, in my view. And with this wiring uh, interface, which is really fun. It's new for most people, and and uh, and perhaps uh, a little bit um, disquieting at first because I've never done this before. Uh, the power that you get from it is enormous, and we have yeah. ten years <clears throat> to this. You know, like uh, <laughs> a duck to water. They start wiring these things up and yeah. and interactions that they they never could develop in a programming no, language. That's true. Any short circuits yet? <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes you're very surprised at the consequences of connecting a wire. <laughs> <laughs> but always interesting. Always interesting. Several people um, have written in the chat room today that this was timely conversation for them back at work. So um, kudos. You and know, one, one, one thing I wanted to bring up, and this is something that, that Michael will probably relate to quite a, quite, quite a bit, and that's... I think our model of e-learning development today in corporations has gone down the tubes. They're forcing instructional designers who are really not that technical or media-oriented to do everything. It makes no sense whatsoever, um, and that's not to disparage an instructional designer. They do what they do pretty well. They're stuck doing you know, the role of, of chief, chief cook, bottle washer, and, and, every, and, and, and diner at the same time. Not a, not a good place to be. And I think that's one of the reasons we've seen the tools really become so much more mediocre in a lot of ways. Um, and, and it's a shame because the industry is suffering for it. I mean, back in the authorware days, you had instructional designers who wrote really good courseware. You had the authors who could put it all together. You had the graphic artists. Now it's one person. It right. doesn't work that well. I think, it, I think it's a real issue, and until that's really addressed, uh, and it's an issue training departments aren't really fighting. They're just kind of going, well, i got to cut budgets. Well, not necessarily. Um, you can do things intelligently with budgets. But 
it, it's just something that we see a lot of, and and I think the pressure on on the poor instructional designer is fairly overwhelming in many cases. We've been in a lot of corporations where they just look flustered, um, you know, and that's that's where where companies like yours come in to kind of off offload that flustering and and let them actually do their jobs. Yes, that's right. We we are often complimenting what staff uh, and organization has internally to, to give them the, the complement of talents and resources they need to, to get a project done. The, these people that you're talking about are often very smart mm -hmm. people, but it's just overwhelming what's being yeah. expected. When we ask them, you know, what's your team like, they say, well, what would you like to know about me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've seen it in one company we work with. They originally had 150 people in their learning and development group, I think it's down to three or four. Yeah. That's that's an enormous drop in people, and and those three or four are doing the projects that all the 150 used to do. Yep, yeah. it's insane. Um, it, 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 you feel that Zebra's apps helps a little bit because uh, it 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 allows you to blend design and development uh, together. So you know we have sketching tools in there, so you can literally just start trying to imagine how you want things to happen and how how they might how it might work uh, and then you can make your sketches fully functional if you want uh, and then when you can either find an artist who can develop the material for you or if you're out there gathering it from from uh, clip art and websites or whatever you just you just drag those graphics or that video or whatever you want on top of elements of your sketch and it swaps your sketch out for the refined material, but retains the interactivity that you that you built in your sketch. And so, it, yeah. so now uh, the the pretty art actually works, just like your okay. sketch actually worked. Yep. And in fact, uh, in about another forty five minutes, you guys have a webinar on Zebra's apps and the new pro features. We do, and we'd yeah. love to have everybody. I, I'll join. be in on that one. I'm already registered. It should be fun. Great. Well, Michael, we've gone for about an hour, <laughs> and we, we could probably keep going for quite a few more hours. This is fun. Well, it's certainly fun for me, Rick. Thank you. And we appreciate you being here. If you have, you know, unfortunately, we didn't have enough time. We'd love to have you on again, and and this time get the chat room more involved, and and because I think you've got so much to share, and it'll it'll just be fun to to have you back on. And um, for all of you people in the chat room, thanks so much for being there. We really appreciate it. And if you're watching the recording, please subscribe. Um, at the end of it, I think at the end of this month, or at, uh, we're going to be giving out some copies of the book. So if you subscribe, you're going to be thrown into a raffle. We'll give out a couple of copies of Leaving um, Addy for Sam. And you so, mean subscribe through YouTube, Through right? YouTube, yep. Yes. And we'll just do a random drawing for a couple of people, and, and you'll get a book. Yay. And just That's let us know. if yeah, we'll, let you, we'll ask you. If you win, we'll ask you if you want a Kindle or regular version. Oh, okay, great. Subscribe through YouTube is the answer because we were discussing that a lot here. Yep, it's a quick, quick click of a button. I should know the answer, but remember, I'm new. <laughs> anyway, Michael, again, thanks so much for being here today. We really appreciate it, and good luck with the products and the book. And I'll see you in a couple weeks at DevLearn. Or good. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next week on Learn Chat. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>